experts from space engineering, science, and Cranfield University Space Department, a world-renowned institute for aerospace and engineering in general. So, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure in introducing to you Dr. Steve Hobbs, who is a leader in space systems and sensors and has been involved in research and covers space systems and radar Earth observations. One of his current projects includes low cost orbit systems for small satellites, for example, DemoSat-1 and ESEO mission. And then we have Dr. Jenny Kingston, who is a lecturer in space systems and a course director for astronautics and space engineering MSc. And she has also been involved in numerous industrial space related studies and research programs, including demo satellite for Temsat on Ariane 502 and satellite integrations. And then we have, last but not least, Professor David Cullen, who is a professor for astrobiology and space biotechnology. His areas of expertise include biosensors and diagnostic, amongst others. One of his current projects involves in investigation of life marker chip ex experiment for evidence of detection on Mars uh, as part of either's ExoMars rover mission. So without further delay, ladies and gentlemen, this is Cranfield University Space Department with engineering in space, Earthlings boldly going. So over to you, Dr. Hobbs. OK, thank you very much. Um, and good afternoon to you all. Uh, but let's check. I hope I'm presenting the, the title slide there. Yeah, and this is some nods. Great. So yes, yeah, so, the, so the three of us will be speaking: uh, Dave, Cullen, uh, Jenny, and, and myself, Steve Hobbs. And I see this is just a very brief introduction to the uh, talks. So it's for more than 60 years now that we've been using space. So the top of the right there, you've got pictures from Sputnik, October 1957. And it's really quite mind boggling to think how far we've come since then. Within just over 10 years, they had, they had the Apollo missions, uh, but now we're in the era where companies like SpaceX are really doing transformative work with their launch there, that one of their Tesla cars and on its way, I think, to Mars from, from that launch back in uh, February 2018. None of this can happen really without excellent engineering. So underpinning all of this really is some uh, really amazing engineering to enable these things to happen. Some of the things that are very special about space are actually it's so difficult to get to fix things, to get there to fix things. So mm -hmm. we're actually remarkably cautious in, in many ways about the technology to make sure that it is as, it is as reliable as we can make it uh, possible. Since the 1960s, space has really become part of society's infrastructure. So I guess nearly all of you will have sat nav enabled on cars in, in your phones. Um, the timing that we get from things like GPS is just fundamental to, to modern society. You know, bank transactions, all sorts of things really depend on GPS for that. And things like, um, well, my own area, Earth observation is really a critical input for all sorts of things like weather forecasting as well as understanding our climate. I won't dwell on that. I'll, uh, I really want to just do a very brief introduction to this area of space engineering. It is such a huge area that we're not going to attempt to cover all of it in this uh, afternoon's presentation. Instead, we've chosen just three areas where each of us has got special expertise and interests. And really with that, I'll just hand over to, to Dave. Um, as the next, uh, the first main presenter, and he'll be talking about Earthlings in space exploration. So over to you, Dave. Thank you. OK, I just need to share the right window. So hopefully you can now see the. Uh, yes, yes, uh, yes, we can. Screen is yours. Uh, I can, I can see your. In full screen. Yeah, that's it better. Yeah. Excellent. OK, so I'm going to start a timer since I don't want to uh, overrun my my colleagues. Uh, so yeah, th thanks for that. So my approach is to, uh, in effect, give uh, a mini presentation on space systems engineering, uh, but in my case, focusing on humans and Earth biology, given my background. And it's very much an eclectic mix. So it's a quick overview just to give kind of the audience 
a kind of a flavor of what's going on rather than going to anything in particular kind of great depth. So I'll do four things briefly, a little bit about my background, and then the first of the three projects I'm going to talk about, something called BAMSAT, which is to get use CubeSats to get earth biology and humans in size, shoebox sized uh, payloads into space. Uh, some work we're doing with uh, architects looking at uh, lunar and potentially Mars habitats and some issues of working with architects and designers. And then the last one, something which initially sounds a little bit kind of strange or a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit of fun, but in reality has hopefully got quite a lot of really important kind of uh, basis behind it, something called astronaut playscape. So that's the three things I'm going to talk about. As I said, I'm going to rush them quite briefly. And also one other key thing, um, the um, uh, I think the, 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 the host introduced me and gave a kind of rather, I think, out-of-date view of what I'm doing. Um, talking about ExoMars and life market ship because that, that actually was is, is now kind of quite a few years out of date. So briefly my background. Uh, originally I had no interest in space whatsoever. So this was my background, biosensors and diagnostics, uh, happily applying these to medical and environmental applications on Earth, uh, including through PhDs, postdocs, and my lectureship and uh, academic work at Cranfield. Uh, but then um, and just the bits in red is important here, I accidentally slipped into the space sector. Uh, okay, well, that, well, it was now about 20 years ago, uh, in that we were developing immunoassay analyzers for detecting pollutants in the environment here on Earth. And it turned out a kind of a, a, a fortuitous meeting with some people from the space sector highlighted that they also wanted instruments to detect trace organics in soil samples. The difference was they were looking for trace organics in Martian soil or regolith, and of course not as pollutants, but as evidence of past life. And so that got me to the space sector, where for a number of years I was kind of co-leading the life market ship multiplex immunoassay instrument for the ExoMars mission, which you can see. If I try and turn on my uh, cursor, where it's gone, uh, pointer options, where's a pointer? Um, you can see the ExoMars rover there, and we had an instrument on the initial payload for that, uh, although it got deselected many, many years ago now. Uh, because of all kinds of changes in the, in the payload. But that got me into the space sector. And so therefore, what you're going to see through projects are things which have then followed on since then. OK, so BAMSAT. So what is BAMSAT? Kind of what are CubeSats? And why are we trying to use CubeSats to fly kind of Earth biology in space? So CubeSats, hopefully most of you know what they are. So I'm not going to go through these slides in detail. Effectively, they're shoebox-sized spacecraft that are fully functioning, launched into kind of Earth orbit or beyond now. Uh, and you can see in this middle picture here, a, a torso, two hands holding a three unit CubeSat. So you can see kind of shoebox sized, fully functioning spacecraft. And so there's a small kind of, uh, kind of or niche activity at the moment of trying to use these platforms, not for Earth observation, not for kind of other science or kind of communications, but to fly biology experiments into space environments, to look at the effect of those space environments on the biology. Um, and this just summarizes again, I'm gonna not go through the details, but there's a growing desire uh, to do bioscience research in space. Initially, it was purely science. Now there's a much more push towards both basic science, applied science, and also thinking about demonstrating how biology can be used to support humans as we go back to the moon, as we go on to Mars, to support human operationally um, for things like nutrition, uh, recycling, whole host of reasons. And therefore there's a desire to get demonstrations of these in space to show that they will function appropriately in space. And therefore CubeSats come in because they are a relatively low cost, rapid way of getting uh, experiments into space. Two ways, either as free-flying CubeSats or more likely nowadays, as a CubeSat-like payload hosted on a larger platform. So for example, inside the ISS. And so that's what we're doing. We're developing something called BAMSAT. In the bottom here, you can see the, um, uh, where BAM, the word BAM comes from. So it's a CubeSat compatible payload that's compatible with doing experiments relevant to bioscience, astrobiology, medical and material science, hence the acronym BAM, where we get the word BAM sat from. So the flavor, what have we done and where are we at the moment with this? So this just shows some very early work from about kind of four or five years ago, where we took 
a microfluidic uh, disc, you can see here in the middle image, containing a relatively small number of individual sample containers to house biology. And in this very early development, we included, included showing that we could fly, oh sorry, grow mammalian cell cultures inside these. So obviously when I say humans inside CubeSats, what I really mean is human cell cultures inside CubeSats. As one of a number of different types of biology, we could fly in a common hardware platform. How has that platform evolved? This shows from again about three years ago, it shows that same disk concept now built into a laboratory breadboard. So you can see the disks here now with a much larger number of, of individual sample containers, um, still something which is about eight centimeters in diameter, but now integrated into something which has all the other facilities we would need in a payload. So in this case, a microscope, pumps, uh, valves, reservoirs for kind of fluids to kind of uh, to interact with the biology that's going to be inside these individual chambers. And so that was an early version of what we wanted to put into, into a payload. This is just a schematic of that showing again the key features, reagent reservoirs, some pumps and valves, the uh, a single chamber in this disk, uh, some other features here, microscope, spectrometer, waste reservoir, more pumps, various sensors. So the, the, the block diagram of what the system is trying to do. Where are we now? So if we take this as being a first generation implementation, we're now on a second generation and preparing to fly an experiment or payload and an experiment on an ESA stratospheric balloon later this year. So uh, we're looking to fly BAMSAT on BEXUS. BEXUS is the name of the ESA stratospheric balloon uh, program. Uh, just shows some quick pictures of the balloon. This is a very large scientific balloon with a large gondola of instruments of which BAMSAT will be one when it flies later this year to take things to the edge of space. So we can test what will happen to BAMSAT in a kind of operational and um, uh, kind of environment. And what does BAMSAT look like at the moment? It's this, it's something which measures 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 20 centimeters and has all of those functions you saw in the previous live breadboard now scaled down uh, into, uh, into this payload that fits inside a little pressure vessel so that when we fly in space or on the balloon, the environment inside is basically room temperature, one atmosphere pressure, um, but of course exposed externally, if in space, to microgravity and space radiation. And this just shows some more of the details Details of a kind of fluidic system we have within these discs, uh, some examples of the hardware, some microscope images of the nematode worms inside one of these chambers, and just what the payload is looking like at the moment, getting very close to flight within about two months' time. And the last little bit here is just where do we go next with this? Uh, there's a whole range of things here. Uh, part of it is to, is to then start demonstrating more by basic science demonstrate the use of mammalian cells, including things like starting to think about using space to grow uh, uh, replacement organs, producing clean foods, basically cultured meats in space for all kinds of reasons, uh, demonstrating some of these industrial biotech applications which humans will need to support themselves in space and the routes to do that. And the ones in red are the, are the ones which we're looking at at the moment, spinning out a company, EU projects kind of already been submitted and about to fly the nematode worms via BAMSA on BEXUS. So a real quick snapshot of, uh, of one project, uh, BAMSAT. Now to very quickly go through a couple of others. Um, habitats on the moon. So we now know that uh, large kind of, uh, kind of groups, be it public, be it private, are looking to get things on the lunar surface. And the view is there is now going to be um, a sustainable human presence or sustainable persistent human presence on the moon in the near future. And therefore we need to think about the systems needed to support those humans on, on, on the lunar surface. And again, there's a whole diverse range of, of those issues. Two things I want to focus on briefly. One is the general infrastructure, the space systems, which is important. And the second one is the actual habitats. And we've brought both of those together in some work we've been doing with architects in that these are the kind of things we need to provide on the lunar surface.
to have a sustainable, persistent presence. Uh, elsewhere, I'm not talking about today, we're working on materials handling and geotechnics. We've got some payloads to demonstrate those on the lunar surface we're working towards. But what I want to focus on is the idea of living uh, on the lunar surface and the habitats needed and the systems to, to kind of uh, sustain that. And also what they can tell us uh, about trying to do sustainability here on Earth. So we talked to architects and this just shows an architect's view of what happens when you don't have architects in view involved in designing or designers involved in designing space systems, space uh, and accommodation for humans. So the ISS clearly not a good place to live for long periods of time. So what we're doing is working with architects to try and figure out how we can inform them about realistic space scenarios so that their, their designs have some potential use in the future. And so a couple of things here. We're working with a group called Hassel, uh, and we've been working with them via our MSc course for a number of years. So we've been working on a couple of, of, of projects looking at Mars and human human. Uh, habitats. One of those, the lunar work from uh, just over a year ago, um, has now led to ESA supported work. And so we're working with Hassel Studios uh, and ESA uh, to look at designing scalable and sustainable lunar habitats, with Cranfield being involved in making sure that the designs are compatible with realistic space system scenarios. Um, we also therefore need to consider humans in the loop within these systems. So including their, phys their physiology, their psychology, human factors, ergonomics and such. And I'll come back to that in a few seconds. But just to give you a flavour, another group of architects we're working with, we're part of something called the Sustainable Off-World Network. And together with some architects from Abibu Abi Studios in the US, uh, we put together and submitted a design concept for a Mars city-state so this is a city state for up to one million citizens. And we submitted that to the Mars Society's design competition just over a year ago. And that got us through to the, fin to the kind of the finalists. And again, if you're interested in that, there's a link there uh, with more details. But remember here, humans in the loop. So this is now just to briefly come on to the last topic, um, which is astronaut place games. Oops. Uh, so I'll just have couple of minutes to finish this off. Uh, astronaut place games. So how was this initiated? So this is a picture of me on the left now over 10 years ago at the European Space Agency with uh, a mock-up of the full-size mock-up of the ESA uh, Columbus module in the background and table football in the foreground. And it started off, off the thought process of, well, could we get table football in space? And so I had a colleague within a, a few minutes of this um, produce a kind of quick 3D uh, representation of what a microgravity table football system could look like. And then it's been kicking around in the back of my mind for a number of years. Clearly, 10 years have passed. Now, as I've already said, there's a lot more focus on getting humans onto the lunar surface. And if we're doing that, there's a need to address all kinds of negative aspects of having humans in reduced gravity and in isolation. Two of those, is altered sensory motor control and issues of kind of team dynamics and how they can degrade. And of course, in both cases, humans in a space system loop is really important. You need to have good sensory motor control. You need to have a functioning team. And therefore, we need to think about uh, strategies to control, to measure and maintain appropriate levels of sensory motor control and team dynamics, as well as uh, doing research on these topics. And so we've come up with the idea of astronaut playscapes. That's to have some kind of microgravity compatible and instrumented version of some recreational activity that involves having fine sensory motor control and involves team dynamics. And so therefore, what we're doing, and this is my penultimate slide, what we're doing now is um, putting together a team uh, to take this forward. And so we're in the process now of, of, of specifying and about to start producing, hopefully, a version of microgravity table football uh, that uh, hopefully will be compatible with microgravity in the long term, potentially for demonstration on the ISS, and then in the short term for demonstration in parabolic flight. And we're putting together a large team of 
a psychologist and physiologist and uh, and the relevant expertise needed to really kind of uh, uh, kind of underpin what appears to be a trivial activity with hard kind of um, uh, hard kind of definitions. And the last slide is because obviously the, uh, of the outreach of outreach potential of this, looking to get some kind of celebrity involvement. And there's been two recent good examples of of relevant celebrity teams. One is French. You can see there a discussion between a French football, uh, national football player and a French astronaut. And literally only a couple of weeks ago, uh, from a UK perspective, a well-known uh, UK footballer and a well-known UK astronaut were actually talking together at Wimbledon. Uh, and so we're now looking to exploit both of these. The student who's working on this project at the moment is French national. Um, so with that, I'll stop. It was just a quick, almost mind dump of kind of about th of three projects we're involved in at the moment, just to give you a flavour of the breadth of activities that's going on within kind of um, uh, the space group at Cranfield. And with that, I will stop, stop sharing my screen. Happy to try and answer any questions at the end and hand over to Steve and Jenny. Thanks, Dave. I'll just load up my slides. So hopefully I'm full screen now. Someone could just give me a thumbs up. Yeah, great, thank you. So hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. I'm Dr Jenny Kingston and I have um, a short presentation about sustainable use of space. So looking at what the issues are, um, some of the challenges and the opportunities to do something about it in the future. So why is sustainability for space an issue? Um, it's worth thinking historically about how we've got to the point that we are currently. Um, and really it's it's in a similar way to the way that we have treated things like large oceans, rivers and so on um, on Earth. Space is very big. So historically we paid relatively little attention to clearing up after our space missions. And so since 1957, the population of artificial objects in Earth orbit has grown hugely. Um, you can see in the image on the right there, um, a graphic illustrating the number of debris objects in low Earth orbit. Um, and the previous approach was really um, just to um, make use of space if you wanted to jettison an object, if you wanted to leave a satellite or a rocket up a stage in orbit at the end of the mission. Nobody really was particularly concerned about it, at least to start with. Um, so, for example, the European Space Agency's EMBISAT, which was launched in 2002, so not really that long ago, had no deorbit plan. Um, in the orbit it's in, it's got about a 150 year lifetime um, and a mass of over eight tonnes. It's about the size of a double decker bus. So it really could become a significant con contributor to debris growth. And the, the situation we're in now is that there are over 700,000 debris objects in Earth orbit, which have got the potential to damage or destroy operational spacecraft and obviously also to provide a threat to humans in space. And only a few thousand of these are actually operational satellites. So why do we need to be concerned about this? So yes, space is big, but the population of satellites and space debris is growing very fast. Um, and it's not only big objects, but there are um, where objects have collided or where um, things have, have fragmented. There are lots of small objects as well, which you can't really track. And it's hard to protect against them because they're going so quickly that if they hit you, they can cause um, catastrophic effects. So you can see on the top right there, um, really tiny objects can cause huge damage even through, um, you know, what you can see at the top there, that's a solid piece of aluminium with a very small object which has hit it at hypervelocity and it causes huge damage. Um, so even back in the late 1970s, there was starting to be recognition that this could be an issue. So Donald Kessler of NASA um, predicted that there was a potential for a, a cascade effect where collisions produce fragments and they could produce more collisions and so on. And that potentially, if left unchecked, that could make whole regions of space unusable. And that started to bring attention to the issue. Um, and today we're really seeing, um, starting to see the effects of debris. So the debris population is, is increasing the risk of damage to operational satellites. We're actually having to um, take avoiding action from, from debris objects. We're having to add um, impact protection onto spacecraft and onto the ISS. Um, and this issue is becoming more and more important 
with the advent of mega constellations such as Starlink, where um, they're originally planning 11,000, they've also filed for permission for another 30,000 satellites, and there are other mega constellations as well. Um, so last year, we had the highest number of satellite launches ever seen, um, nearly 1,300 satellites launched in a single year. So you can see in this figure here the way that um, the space debris population has grown. Um, so the blue line shows the total number of objects which are trackable. So these are, are above a certain size. That doesn't mean that there aren't smaller objects and lots of them that could cause catastrophic impacts. Um, and you can actually see on the figure that there were two big jumps in the population. Um, so in 2007, the, the, the Chinese um, conducted an anti-satellite test in space. So they actually deliberately destroyed a satellite and produced a huge number of fragments which have stayed in orbit. And then in 2009, there was a very famous collision between an operational um, Iridium satellite and a dead um, Soviet Cosmos satellite. And both of these have in increased the debris population substantially. So the Iridium Cosmos collision was sort of the first big famous event to happen, which really showed that space debris could be a significant hazard to satellites which are, which are in operation. Um, so their relative velocity between these two objects was nearly 12 kilometers per second. Um, and obviously, you know, we do monitor objects in space and the, um, the Iridium satellite operators obviously know where their satellite is and they do keep a check on, on other objects. Um, and there are systems in use, such as the Socrates system shown here, which will um, do conjunction analyses and give you a warning um, of when something might, might hit you. But obviously there are inaccuracies within the tracking. And so in fact, this collision, whilst it, was, it did come up as a warning, um, it wasn't even the top close approach for that week. So they were getting about 400 close approach reports per week. Um, and you can't just constantly be moving your satellites around to try and avoid collisions. And in fact, if you do so, um, you also have a risk of, of moving into the path of something rather than away from it. So this collision happened and um, produced huge amounts of debris, which then spread out around low Earth orbit. And there's a link there on to uh, a simulation on YouTube if you're interested to have a look at that. So it's very important we do something um, about this. If we do nothing, objects in space particularly well, in, in the higher altitude orbits, stay there for a really long time. So this figure is it's a nice figure, which actually produced by, um, by my colleague Steve Hobbs. Um, and it illustrates just how long objects do stay um, in, in Earth orbit. So if we don't actively remove them, once you're above about 800 kilometers, there's no natural removal process. So in lower orbits, atmospheric drag will naturally remove objects. Um, but in this figure here, for example, it shows if, if there had been people around at the beginning of the Ice Age and they had launched satellites into a 2000 kilometer altitude orbit, those objects would still be there. So they're, they're not going to decay naturally. Um, the, um, the oldest human created object in space is Vanguard 1, which was launched in 1958. It was the, the fourth satellite that humans put into space that's still there and it's going to be there for, for centuries. So these things don't just naturally um, go away. We have to do something about it. So in response to these issues, um, um, space agencies formed um, a committee called the, the IADC and they've come up with guidelines to address this issue. So there are two different ways of approaching it. One is mitigation. So you try and avoid creating new debris so you don't release objects. Um, when your spacecraft comes to the end of its mission, you remove it from orbit within 25 years, preferably less. You use collision avoidance, so you track other objects and you avoid collisions. And also at the end of your mission, you passivate your spacecraft, so you get rid of any pressurised um, fuel that's left, you discharge batteries and so on, so that you avoid things exploding and creating more objects. So that helps to prevent the creation of new debris. Then you've also got this requirement to remove existing debris. So this is known as remediation. So capturing the debris by docking with it, using claws, nets, harpoons, and so on, and then actually dragging it down out of orbit using propulsion. And the European Space Agency, for example, started up their Clean Space Initiative in 2012. And that also includes things like eco-design and using green technologies. So sort of 
less environmentally harmful rocket propellant and so on. Um, within Cranfield, we've we've been working on the, the mitigation side um, of, of space debris. Um, and we've aimed at the sort of um, lower cost end of the market. So you can actively remove your satellite at the end of the mission using propulsion, but that's quite expensive. Um, and particularly for small low cost satellites, um, that might not be feasible. So what we've done in Cranfield is to develop drag sails, which enhance the natural orbital decay. Um, so it's a small, um, a small sail which is deployed at the end of a mission it enhances the aerodynamic drag and means that satellites can be removed within the 25 years of the end of the mission. And you can see here um, in the figure that the re-entry time is much reduced if you increase the drag area. Um, and so you can either put your satellite in a higher orbit and still comply with, with removal within 25 years, um, or you can just bring it down more quickly and therefore um, mean it's, it's not causing a hazard. So within Cranfield, we've we've um, got a couple of these, um, a couple of different designs of drag sails. So this one is known as the Icarus design. The first one of these we launched back in 2014 on the UK's Tech DemoSat satellite. Um, and you can see in the top right the uh, the sail. Uh, this folds out at the end of the mission and enhances the drag. And there's an image there of it um, in orbit, um, Stratus impression of it in orbit. On the bottom left, there is a picture of um, of it actually, that's actually a real picture from space of the sail deployed. Um, and so on Tech Demo Sat 1, the presence of that sail is, is expected to, to mean that it will re enter in less than nine years from its end of mission and it would have taken otherwise a lot longer. Um, we also produced another one um, on another UK satellite called Carbonite 1, um, and that was actually required to make that satellite compliant with the 25 year guideline, otherwise it wouldn't have got a, a launch license. So both of these drag sails are in orbit, they've been successfully deployed and they're currently deorbiting the satellites. Uh, we've also got another concept uh, design shown here, which is a much more compact design. And we flew that on the um, European Space Agency ESEO satellite. Uh, this was designed and built by students. Um, and that's also currently in orbit. Um, and we're also working at the moment on a hybrid concept, which combines the sort of best aspects of both of these designs and will be adaptable to a wider range of small satellite customers. Um, and that's being developed by students at the moment who are going to be testing it on a, a zero G parabolic flight campaign this, this autumn. So just to finish off, um, there are some big challenges with space debris. So space debris mitigation is a really good thing. It's stopping the, the, the mass of space debris increasing. Um, but as things break up and collide with each other in orbit, the number of objects keeps growing. Um, and as we've seen, even small objects can be very hazardous. So in order to flatten the curve, we need to actually remove objects actively. So on that, the top right hand figure there, the red line is showing the way that the number of objects is going to increase, even if we use mitigation. So we're, we're doing post-mission disposal, we're cleaning up after ourselves at the end of new missions, but we're not removing anything. In order to flatten that curve and get to the green line, we're going to have to remove about five large debris objects per year to stop debris from growing. And obviously this is very expensive. It costs around $10,000 per kilogram to get things into space. It, it costs a similar amount actually to bring them down again. So somebody has to pay for this. Um, and so, you know, you're effectively doing more launches just to remove dead satellites. Also, if you're removing them and they're burning up in the atmosphere, large objects don't all burn up. So you have a potential hazard on the ground. So you can see a couple of figures there of fuel tanks that have survived re-entry. And obviously that is a hazard. And also coming down through the atmosphere and, and burning up is going to be polluting the Earth's atmosphere as well. But there are opportunities. So one of the things that is being researched is um, innovation in satellite demisability. So selecting materials and designs to mean that when satellites do re-enter, um, they're going to fully burn up and not cause a hazard. So in that top right hand image there, you can see a sort of demisability concept where panels of the spacecraft have been designed to sort of come up, come apart and, and make sure everything burns up. There's also um, a lot of work going on into making missions um, sort of more sustainable than themselves. So refueling them in orbit, servicing them on orbit so that you extend the satellite lifetime and you're not having that kind of throwaway approach to satellite missions. 
And then there are some opportunities for the future. So possibly actually doing recycling of dead satellites and, and space debris. So you could actually use the material that's already in orbit to repair and, ma and manufacture new spacecraft. So it would be great if we could actually work towards a circular in orbit economy so that the space debris becomes a resource instead of a problem. That would be really the ultimate goal. And that's uh, what we're one of the things we're working on here in Cranfield. So with that, I will stop and pass over to Steve. So um, we'll leave questions till the end. Uh, thank you. I'll stop sharing. OK, thank you, Jenny. Let's get my presentation up, but there we are. <clears throat> oh, it's sorry, it's showing the wrong presentation. Yeah, you should be able to see that uh, first slide there. So about Earth observation. <clears throat> yeah, that's good. Good, thank, thanks, Jenny. Uh, so Earth observation, the these few slides here are um, a little bit of an introduction to some of the technology that we currently have for Earth observation. But um, the general theme of that is sort of uh, helping us to live more sustainably on Earth. This first slide here really just pointing out with the image there that one of the main um, pastimes of uh, astronauts on the space station is actually sitting around the cupola window have they shown there and just admiring Earth from space. You know, it's the thing that they love to do when they have their spare time and you can sort of understand that really with um, when you look around in space at the blackness of space. We just haven't seen any other objects like Earth with as much, uh, you know, going on really on, on the planet. By comparison, there are plenty of quite dramatic objects in the solar system, but nothing with really quite this a beauty and amazing uh, complexity of, of life on it, as we've seen with Earth. And so it's it, to me, it's no surprise really that astronauts s spend their free time just admiring and sort of fascinating the, the watching Earth going by underneath. And at the bottom there, the picture that uh, NASA took back in 1968. So Christmas, I think it was Christmas Eve 1968, that picture from Apollo 8 of Earthrise really, I think, encapsulated for, for many people this sort of beauty and fragility of the Earth's climate. And although it, it's not something that is an image used for huge scientific value, I think the um, way that it encapsulates the Earth's climate has got a huge power really for us. That That's an image that most of us now got in our minds as to the Earth's environment, seeing the planet Earth, this so-called blue marble suspended in the blackness of space and just realising how precious and perhaps how vulnerable Earth's climate is. So I think irrespective of the purely sort of scientific value of our measurements, there's quite an important motivational aspect and almost poetic aspect of seeing the earth like that. So those are sort of not particularly scientific uh, values of earth observation, but I think it's hugely important in terms of how we understand our planet. The sort of technologies that go on behind this are, as with many observing systems, so things like op precision optics, uh, my own radar, my own interest in research is particularly uh, with radar systems and what you can do with these different measurement systems to get information about the processes going on there on planet Earth. One of the biggest lessons that we've learned though with particularly, and space really brings this home though, is the importance of system engineering. So NASA learned this back in the 1960s when they were putting the Apollo missions together. They realized that with something that was as complex as a space mission, there, there was a role for people who could take that systems perspective and so really through the space industry, that system engineering role has really come to the fore. And it's something that we try to emphasize in our teaching at Cranfield. And it also sort of colors the sort of research that we do. So some of my own 
recent work on, on a radar mission for the European Space Agency was very much in that role of a system engineer trying to bring together the scientists and their needs with the constraints that were coming from the engineering and then trying to make sure that the system as a whole met the needs uh, that have been defined for it. The next slide here, this is um, looking at some of the geostationary Im images that we've got. So these are some of the first ones that we use satellites for. And uh, you're probably familiar with this type of image from the weather forecast. So that they, they used to show these satellite images and, and still do sometimes if they're particularly dramatic features coming across the Atlantic towards the UK. But it was these images here which uh, were given to um, meteorologists and they could use this to see the patterns in the synoptic structures coming across the Atlantic, typically on the prevailing winds towards Western Europe, and use that to improve the weather forecast that they had in, in those days. Initially, it was used just um, in a sort of qualitative way. So the, the experts, the weather forecasters would look at these images and use the qualitative image uh, information to improve their forecasts. Nowadays, we're able to use the quantitative measurements made by satellites. So both here in the visible band, but also we can have uh, images like this one where we're looking in the water vapour in the near infrared bands to the amount of water vapour in the atmosphere. And we can use all this information um, quantitatively. When you're looking out from geo, from geostationary orbits, so this is the one that Arthur C. Clarke um, famously um, wrote about back in the 1940s. So during the Second World War, he wrote a, a well-known article in, in Radio World pointing out that there was this particular orbit height where the satellite rotated at exactly the same speed as the Earth is turning, and therefore the satellite would seem to be hovering over the Earth's equator. And we, we use that now for weather forecasting. It's really valuable for that. Our satellite TV and one of my own research interests is whether we could put a radar into that orbit and make some sort of measurements there because you see that whole Earth disk, it means you can image wherever you want over that whole disk and whenever you want. So it's a very useful orbit compared to some of the other ones we have to use for satellites. So this is sort of one extreme of the Earth observation world. You've probably seen the other extreme in terms of the way that we can use things like Google Earth. So I won't particularly um, talk about that because I, I guess many of you will be familiar with those images from Google Earth when you can, with satellite images, it, um, never mind the airborne ones, you can see details down that are less than a metre. So you can see almost individual people, perhaps on, on a sports pitch. But the image I put in front here on the slide is one using radar. And I think to me, this is just amazing what we can do now from space in that these fringes, these coloured fringes you can see across the landscape. So this is actually showing you how the Earth's surface was distorted um, after an earthquake. And the, the change between one of those, say, blue fringes and the next blue fringe is just an extra 28 millimetres of displacement of the Earth's surface. So you can see the fine detail in between that. We can make measurements of displacements of the Earth's surface down to just a few millimetres accuracy. And we're doing that with satellites that are in space, um, sort of about 800 kilometres away. They just take a snapshot, which takes le less than a second to form the image like this. Uh, and yet we can make these really precise measurements, which have now become a routine part of uh, a lot of geophysicists' work if they're interested in the dynamics of things at the Earth's surface, like in this case, um, earthquakes, but also glacier motion we can pick up in this way. You can even see um, volcanoes swelling and contracting as the pressures inside them change. And uh, if there's irrigation, you can see the ground rising and falling as the irrigation changes or as underground reservoirs uh, change, either for water, or we're able to see this now with some of these gas fields where we're doing uh, carbon sequestration, pumping gas back underneath the ground. You can actually see the ground rising in response to that, and it's, and it's all using these radar techniques. Um, so with these, we can get down to resolutions sort of well below 10 metres, and uh, with, with the more specialised images, down to just a metre or so. So with Earth observation, we've got images going this global scale, where you can see the Earth's environment at, at that sort of 
uh, global uh, scale and with the images extending with data sets over more than uh, well decades back to the 1960s. I think some of the Landsat data sets go back that far. So we can start to see climate changing over those time scales. We can look in very fine detail at uh, the Earth's surface with uh, these sort of more local images. And between them, they make a huge contribution really to our understanding of the, uh, of the Earth system. The last image though, is perhaps taking us back towards the poetry. Uh, and this is perhaps a famous image that I, maybe some of you already know, this pale blue dot. But this one was taken really at the suggestion of Carl Sagan back in February 1990 from the Voyager 1 spacecraft. So one of its last images back at Earth. And really all you can see, because it was looking back so close towards the sun, is a blackness of space and a couple of sort of uh, fringes of light that were leaking from the sun across the image. But in one of those fringes, and I think there's the, um, yeah, the arrow, arrow there, it's pointing to it. There's a pale blue dot, sort of barely one pixel in size. But that is the, that's planet Earth. And that's where all of human history has taken place over what, uh, the last few million years. The whole planet's history going back uh, billions of years, everything really that we know of all the people who've ever lived, the people that we know personally, the people we read about, everything that we know about has really happened on that one little pale blue, blue dot. And uh, if space hasn't taught us anything else, I think the sort of fragility of that uh, planet and its importance to us and really the way that we should therefore treasure, treasure it, I think really do come across. And it's a common experience of astronauts who've flown and uh, been in orbit, whether they were on the Apollo missions or more recently on the space station, just the uh, respect that they have and the awe at the beauty of, of planet Earth from that. And the numbers you get from these space missions are just mind boggling. So already in 1990, Voyager 1 was 5.5 light hours away. So, we, you know, speed of light is just astonishingly fast. And yet, even at the speed of light, it would take five and a half hours for the signal to travel those 3.7 billion miles that it was back in 1990. I just checked before this presentation and the distances now have gone up to about sort of uh, what nearly four or five times that distance. So both Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 have now left the solar system and are, and are on their way now out into interplanetary space. So it, it's an amazing uh, realm to work in is space engineering because we're teaching people, we're, we're meeting our colleagues who are involved in these space missions and some of these numbers and uh, phenomena that we work with really are just mind boggling compared with life here back on Earth. So that sort of completes the presentation. I've put one of my favourite here space images back up on the slide. In a way, that's what I still think of as a real space rocket, even though uh, nobody from NASA or even SpaceX has got around to building one of those yet. But I see someday I hope that's what they'll be. So thank you very much for your attention on behalf of all three of us, and we'd be very pleased really to take any questions that you might have. Right, and I think that should get us back Thank to uh, the Thank three you, of us Dr. Now House on and everyone. Um, I managed to put one in the chat at the time uh, for Professor Cullen. Uh, are there any risks in cell development in space and uh, how are they managed? So <clears throat> when you say cell development, I'm assuming you're talking about human cells, are you? Any type of cells, plant cells? Or... OK, so basically earth biology. Um, so clearly, yes, um, the, the earth biology has evolved over kind of um, millennia, well, not millennia uh, yeah, um, over kind of millions, billions of years um, in a primarily kind of uh, 1G so kind of a, a gravity kind of environment and um, and a, a radiate an ionizing radiation environment that we find at the surface of the Earth. Uh, so it's clearly not zero. Go to space and certainly microgravity in certain situations uh, or reduced gravity in others uh, is a it will affect the both the kind of whole organism and and, and the cell level and likewise radiation. So clearly there are challenges. 
We still don't know all of the details, but clearly we've also now got 50 years or more of knowledge of what happens to biology when we put it into space. So we know what happens in relatively short terms to some extent. One of the big questions we've got going forward is what happens with really, really long extended stay in space and especially beyond low Earth orbit, because we've got very little data on Earth biology in the radiation environments we can find beyond low Earth orbit. And so, yes, they were all open questions. Um, they are things which, for example, for humans on the journey to Mars, we are very much at the border uh, of what is viewed as being societally acceptable in terms of the radiation risk that we expose the astronauts to. So, yeah, the, the, so the answer is yes. Uh, there's still lots of unknowns, but at the moment, it doesn't necessarily look like a complete showstopper. Uh, okay, very top level comments, but I, I'm happy to kind of explore those in a bit more detail if necessary. And certainly with BAMSAT, we are looking to get Earth biology of various kinds in those environments so that we can study what the effect is um, in under obviously controlled conditions. I think you're muted. Thanks. <laughs> yes, I said uh, thanks for that. So we don't we don't see any questions in the. Oh, yeah, there is there is another one from uh, Helen Aries. How can humans make sure we don't leave space in worse conditions that we found it in? That's a very good question. I think arguably we already have left space in a worse condition than we found it. But what we're trying to do now is address that. Um, but as, as I mentioned in the presentation, that's a big challenge because we've been launching things for, you know, since since uh, 1957 and, and these things have been accumulating in space and so not just satellites, but bits of, of launch vehicles and so on. So what we're trying to do now is identify what's the best approach we can take, both in terms of new things that we're launching into space so that those new things aren't going to get left up there. Um, and, and cause a problem, but also how we can best address tackling the things which are already up there. Um, and that is a big problem because um, it, it costs a lot to get things into space. It also costs a lot to get things down from space. So if you've got to launch a mission to, um, to deorbit a large piece of debris like MBSAT, for example, you've got to launch a large spacecraft with lots of propulsion, you know, all of the very expensive high-tech space systems that you need for any spacecraft. And all it's then going to do is, is go up, grab hold of that piece of debris, and then re-enter it and crash it into an ocean somewhere. Um, so th that issue of who's going to pay for that is, is really a, a problem. That's one of the reasons why we're, we're looking at this, this concept of trying to make use of, of the things that are already in space so we can actually perhaps use those materials and those components to build new items. So yes, they would then still be in space, but they're actually then still doing something useful. Um, but yes, it's, it's a very difficult challenge. Yeah. It, um, it makes it more sustainable as well then. Exactly. And it yeah. also means that you're not having to launch as much, as much mass. And I just see there's another sort of... There's another to, one for you. Yes. Tackle that quickly, if I can. Um, so yes, it, it, it could be possible to attach drag sail to existing objects. So obviously they have to be objects in a low enough orbit that there is some aerodynamic drag um, existing there. But yes, that is something that you could do. You could have a, a spacecraft which goes around and has, has deorbit packages that could be drag sails, they could be propulsion that you attach to existing debris, and then you deal with it that way, definitely. Okay, uh, we have here from Hassan Ali. Uh, if we do get to Mars, uh, so basically, what is the intention? If we're going to Mars, what will we do when we go to Mars? Oh, that's easy. It's from a, it's from a young member. <laughs> yeah, that, that's easy. Geopolitical flag waving and kind of the personal prestige of high net worth individuals would be the cynical view. Um, a nice market. <laughs> um, but then, of course, the other aspects are, yeah, it, it depends what spin you want to put on it. Um, so clearly there is talk at the moment in terms of lunar, of a lunar economy, and therefore starting to make it sustainable, both financially because of having actual kind of lunar commerce. And of course, one argument is that 
that we can go to Mars and eventually, once the infrastructure is in place, it can become self-supporting in terms of a, of a Martian economy. And that was part, and in fact, I mentioned it in my kind of talk, um, that we, we put together a kind of uh, uh, a design for a Mars city, city um, scape with up to a million uh, citizens. And part of that argument was based around having a kind of semi-independent Mars economy. Uh, and therefore, obviously, there was there was discussions there about obviously Martian resources, uh, about um, having a Martian environment that created a different a kind of different kind of innovations that could have value back on Earth. So, yeah, it, it, it's not clear cut what it is at the moment. Um, that's still, again, an open question as to kind of what will we do on Mars apart from just going there and flag planting? Yeah. OK, quite a few more questions coming in and we're a bit restrictive to time. Let's see how much we can get through. Uh, I think this is again for Dr. Kingston regarding littering. Would you see concerns with further space littering given the increasing space tourism activities and the commercial barriers? OK, so well, first of all, um, I mean, the recent the recent space tourism wasn't actually orbital. So anything, you know, if they chucked anything out of those, it wouldn't have gone into orbit because they weren't orbital. So from that point of view, um, those sorts of space tourism aren't going to, to produce space debris. Um, there, there is now starting to be a certain amount of policing and regulation about um, littering in space. So in, in some countries, um, it's not just guidelines about space debris mitigation. It's actually it's actually uh, law now. So in order to get a license to launch a spacecraft, you've got to show what you're going to do at the end of your mission in order to remove it from orbit and that you're not going to be uh, producing any debris. Um, so that is starting to become um, more more of a, um, a requirement in more and more countries. And I think it will just continue to increase. So I think in terms of littering it's it's really more of a concern for these mega constellations of thousands of satellites rather than space tourism to be honest in terms of commercial activities okay thanks a couple more left if we dare mention the b word brexit any impact on funding maybe steve hobbs yeah uh, well to be honest yes there is a bit of an, of an impact there um in, immediately we're seeing a little bit with some hesitancy over the new Horizon Europe programmes. So I think there's been a, d a delay to, to that because some of the space areas uh, were. Uh, the EU seemed to be playing a bit of politics on that, uh, but it, it's all quite a complicated area. And so we're seeing a, a postponement in funding there. But the, the space industry is such a, um, an international business that you know many of the companies like Airbus, Talus have got very strong links with uh, company um, affiliates across uh, the, the continent so in the EU and it's certainly making it is a bit of a headache for us in the space uh, business. On the other, other side the UK's ambition is quite clear to become a sort of major space country a major player in the space field and so I think that, that we are seeing some serious government uh, ambitions really to see space develop as, as, an, as a sector. I, I've, uh, you know, we're working with young students on our MSc course here and it's really quite an exciting time for them to be moving into the space business. So there are all sorts of opportunities coming up but certainly Brexit does complicate things a little bit. Perfect. Do you want to take that one Jenny? Uh, I'll, I'll actually pass that one to today because I think that's that's probably more relevant to to his sort of space ex exploration interests. That's okay. Oh yes. Yeah. So, so this is the, so if this 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 is the question about sustainable approach to doing stuff on the lunar surface. Yes, th there is big 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 issues there. Um, so at the moment, for example, uh, there's a, a lot of excitement about the potentially being water in permanently shadowed regions at high latitudes, so basically the South Pole. Um, and that has been a deposit that appears to have built up over, again, a few billion years. And so it's almost an analogue of fossil fuels on Earth that we could go there and suddenly start mining that water, uh, using it, releasing it into the lunar exosphere, uh, which, can, which 
can have all kinds of kind of issues in terms of transport and 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 contamination and destroy, destroying potential science. Um, and so yes, it, it is in one of ways an analog of fossil fuels. And so therefore, certainly there are uh, there's a significant fraction of, of, of the community that is saying we should be really careful about how we exploit the, the lunar surface so we don't do exactly the same as what we've done historically on Earth, that we try and maintain um, the moon in a usable form for those in the future. And also we potentially use the moon as an analogue of what we should be doing back on Earth. And so use the moon as an exemplar to better develop procedures and understanding and metrics that we can actually apply back on Earth to solve the problems we have on Earth. So yeah, again, a very, very complex uh, kind of question or issue uh, that is both technical and definitely also political and geopolitical as well. Okay, I just have, uh, since uh, Dr. Hobbs presented all this poetic imagery um, about rainbows, how are they formed? Are they formed because of Earth? Are they formed because of other phenomena in space? Oh, that, that, that's that's not too hard to explain. It's um, due to the way that light gets reflected within raindrops. So they are, they are formed on Earth. OK. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you. And, and in fact, I think it, if it's three reflections, you get the main bow. Then maybe if it's four reflections, you get the secondary bow. It, it's something along those lines. Thanks. Are there any more questions? If somebody wants to unmute and ask before we close. Apologies for going a little over time. So I think that's it. OK, so yeah, so just on the closure notes, I just want to thank everyone for joining the webinar. Uh, just for information, if you want more information on Key, you can visit our website or you can also follow us on our LinkedIn page. So you just have to search for Key Warwickshire in LinkedIn. And if you want specific to today's subject on space and Cranfield, you can visit Cranfield website uh, and you can also find the profiles of uh, the speakers today on, on the Cranfield uh, website. So with that, I just want to say a big thank you to our speakers from Cranfield Space Department. Thank you for sharing your interests and thank you to everyone else for attending today. Uh, so have a great afternoon and hopefully we'll see you again on one of our next webinars coming soon. So you just keep your eye on that Mercury website. Thank you. Yeah. Goodbye everyone. Yeah, thanks everyone. Bye bye.